Welcome to lecture 29. So in this lecture, we will discuss real-time communications in a LAN. So this lecture and the next lecture both will be dedicated towards real-time networking or real-time communication. And after that, we'll get into real-time databases. So the key question is, can we use a bus-based protocol like Ethernet for real-time communications? So of course, in a high load situation, there are increased delays and drop in throughput. And the reason, of course, is the contention, right? The number of collisions, as we have seen, between multiple uh, stations connected. So a node connected to a bus is typically known as a station in networking terminology. So multiple stations connected or multiple nodes connected would try to transmit at the same time. And that would lead to a high rate of collisions. So then again, the moment there is a collision, it would lead to a retransmission. This is why. Ethernet networks are not preferable and often contraindicated in real-time applications. So if you are talking of hard real-time applications, particularly with CBR, constant bitrate traffic, where the traffic is somewhat predictable, the network utilization is de deliberately kept low, such that delays are predictable. And this is far more important than actually increasing the utilization of the network. Because in this case, as we have seen with CPU scheduling, for instance, we will not be able to guarantee that things are, that the traffic is indeed schedulable, right? This is something that we will not be able to guarantee. So after looking at CBR and hard real-time traffic, soft and non-real-time traffic will be allowed to be transmitted whenever there are these gaps. So the same way that we saw in CPU scheduling that whenever, you know, we are not actually scheduling real time processes, we have these gaps, uh, other messages, other traffic can be transmitted. So there are three main categories of protocols that uh, are there in a LAN. Global priority protocols, bounded access scheduling. So bounded access is basically a method of inducing some degree of rate control such that the network cannot be taken over. And then calendar-based protocols. So calendar-based protocols is similar to bounded access in terms of the design philosophy. And global priority is something similar to EDF and RMS in terms of the design philosophy. Of course, the design is totally different in terms of the philosophy, that is. So let's first discuss global priority protocols. So as you have seen, the CAN bus, for instance, that we discussed in the last lecture would be an example of a global priority protocol. So each message is assigned a priority value. The MAC layer protocols, as we have said in the data link layer in the second layer, there are two sub layers, the LLC layer and the MAC layer, but we're interested in the MAC layer. So the MAC layer protocol would try to ensure that at any point of time, the highest priority message is served, which we have seen to happen in the case of a CAN bus. So RMA or EDF can then be used to schedule the messages, right? So, so we can use the same similar kind of uh, algorithms as we did for CPU scheduling. It can be done over here. But it is just that there are many you know, practical things in a network which makes RMA and EDF inefficient because in the CPU, everything was running on the same hardware. All the priorities and even the intent to execute, this was accessible. But a network, by definition, is a distributed system. So, it is though, so there is no single centralized arbiter which can make these decisions. The global priority protocol, it cannot determine, you know, it is hard to determine which message has the highest, highest priority at any instant of time. So this is because, the, as I have argued, the messages originate at different nodes, so we don't have a global view. Also, the other thing is that a task is not the same as packet scheduling. For example, you know, tasks at the min middle can be preempted, right? So instead of one task, you can start running another task. But while sending a packet, right, over the network, it's not possible to preempt packet transmission. So this is why these are not the same. So this is why global scheduling is not really the same, even though, you know, some simple networks like CAN buses use it. 
but we should look at other kinds of bounded access and calendar based protocols and then there are a few more like the countdown protocol virtual time protocol and so on so we'll discuss these four calendar bounded access countdown and virtual time in the remainder of the lecture right and important applications and subclasses so the calendar based protocol is like this that you have a dynamic reservation technique in the sense you assume that all the nodes connected to the bus are known they are known a priori so when you are looking at periodic messages right so this is of course efficient for a cbr kind of a setting where the messages are periodic and it is quite difficult otherwise to handle sporadic and a periodic messages so this is something which is extremely difficult to handle in this particular setting we will see why so the idea is that the time period during which a node is allowed to transmit uh, <clears throat> is kind of known to everybody so what happens is every node has a calendar which basically says when each node is allowed to transmit and of course they share a notion of global time in the sense everybody has this common shared global clock so they know that look for this time duration node 1 is going to transmit then node 2 then node 3 and so on and again the schedule repeats something that we have also seen in the cyclic scheduler right where you know you create a schedule and the schedule repeats so the calendar based protocol is something what the cyclic scheduler was for a, a cpu or even for that matter rma right rma rms we are using interchangeably so this basically says that for guaranteed messages which are cbr like periodic messages you maintain a calendar which is nothing but an analog of a cyclic scheduler for a network so now the idea is that when a message arrives which has not been given a reservation slot which would be one of those a periodic sporadic messages it is necessary to determine a free slot by con by pretty much consulting the local calendar to see if there is a free slot then we need to broadcast this message to the rest that look i have this new message i want to utilize uh, some time in which nobody is transmitting so of course if i have enough time that is that has been given to me i can use that but assuming i don't have that then i need to take everybody's permission before a new message is actually sent right so the nodes will update their local calendars accordingly so bounded access protocol uh, right is something which tries to slightly you know, ameliorate the problems with the calendar based protocol in this case the time that a node is allowed to access the channel is bounded so this is pretty much like one of those classic round robin kind of schedulers where you know node 1 gets some time then node 2 then node 3 and then node 1 kind of similar to a calendar kind of thing but it is just that uh, instead of maintaining an explicit list you just put a bound on the time so this means it also puts a bound on the amount of data that can be transmitted then nodes will then use a local scheduling algorithm in the sense if they have multiple packets that are queued for transmission they will then you know mutually decide which packet to send first and which one to send later so coming to the countdown protocol the countdown protocol is again you know going back to a global priority based protocol so what we have seen with both calendar as well as bounded access is that you are kind of limiting the access so with limiting the access you are ensuring that everybody is getting some degree of a fair share or a proportional share in the case of a countdown protocol you divide you know an epoch of time into fixed size intervals call them slots at the start of each slot <clears throat> a certain priority arbitration is carried out to determine the highest priority message in the sense what you do is that you discretize time into time units at the starting position of each time uh, you look at all the nodes and all the messages that they have you determine the highest priority message so of course you provisioned some time for doing that and then you send that message so the question is what should be the appropriate slot size so this is very critical for the efficient 
working of the protocol. So see, the slot size needs to at least be equal to the end-to-end -end propagation delay because at least you know the message should reach, right? The message should uh, reach the destination node before somebody else starts transmitting. Otherwise, there will be a collision. And if the slot size is uh, very small, you know these collisions will go undetected. And if the slot size is too large, then of course you can have wastage. Something like you know uh, analogous to internal fragmentation in memories, you will have time wastage. So an example of priority arbitration, as we have seen, is the CAN bus, where of course they you know broadcast. So the priority, uh, the CAN bus is more like a countdown protocol where you divide time into slots and then of course you send their priorities so in this case for this example higher the priority uh, you know uh, higher the number higher the priority so as you can see message 20 is the one that has the highest priority so these two messages get cancelled and then the rest of the data bits are sent so the countdown protocol as we have just seen is something which is canvas so now coming to the fourth of the protocols in our list, the virtual time protocol. Here, basically, we use the state of the channel. We sense the state of the channel to figure out when to send packets. So node, of course, is assigned a priority based on the its highest priority message or the highest priority message that it contains. So each node that has a packet to send waits for an interval of time in this case. So this interval of time for which the node actually waits is inversely proportional to the priority of the highest priority message that it contains, which means that if it contains a very high priority message, it waits for a smaller duration. Otherwise, it waits for a longer duration. So the lower the priority of a message, the longer it waits, higher the lesser amount of time, a smaller amount of time it waits. So what it does is that after waiting, it again senses the channel, right? So this is something similar to the way that we access a cell phone channel. So the channel is busy, well, no problem, it waits again. So instead of following a regular exponential back off strategy, which in many cases is followed, where you basically sense the channel if it's busy or you try to send there is a collision, you wait for a random amount of time where the range is between 0 and x at the beginning then 0 and 2x 0 and 4x and so on in this case what you do is you actually wait for a duration which is proportional to inversely proportional to the priority of the message that you contain which is more in line with our real time thinking right so now let's now discuss some practical protocols so the first would be the ieee 802.5 priority based token ring protocol this is very popular and it's also an, it's a very popular IEEE standard as well so in this case this is a logical ring may not be a physical ring but logically means every node knows who is its left neighbor and right neighbor so the header of the token contains a reservation field and a mode field so the token will alternate between the reservation mode and the free mode right uh, so there will be a mode bit and a reservation field and the mode bit will either be reserved or free So we will see how this is used. So the header is important. The rest of the payload is not important for the purpose of getting access to the channel So in 802.5 the token ring protocol the reservation field stores the priority of the message and we are assuming that the priority is honestly allocated as honestly uh, right written on the message so the messages themselves are split into frames. So in this case, what happens is that you circulate a token. So the reservation field is checked by each node. So each node basically checks this field of the token. And if a node has a higher priority message, right, whose reservation priority is higher than what is there in the token, then it will basically overwrite it. In the sense, it will overwrite the reservation uh, field in the token with the priority it has. So here, of course, you're assuming that all the nodes are cooperating and there is full honesty in the system. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So what happens is that now when the token comes back to the original sender, 
the original sender knows that who has the highest priority message in the entire network and then you know that node is allowed to transmit right so when it returns it knows that who has the highest priority so if let's say its own priority and id comes back then it knows that nobody else has a higher priority so it can uh, basically uh, transmit otherwise if there is some other node which has a higher priority it has to free the token and essentially give it the token so so give the node to that uh, token to that high priority node so when the token reaches that high priority node that made the reservation it will essentially capture the token and start the process of transmitting so this is how you actually arbitrate for who has the highest priority message few important observations so the minimum time that is required to complete the transmission of a frame so recall that a packet is broken or divided into multiple frames so the minimum time that is required is max of f theta where f is the time that is needed to transmit a frame and theta is its propagation time right basically the idea is that a node does not transmit the next frame until it has completed sending the last bit of the frame right so the entire bit has been the entire frame has reached and the header of the transmitted token has come back right so if you actually see the time it takes to transmit the entire frame is f and the time it takes to reach uh, for the first few bits right so if you consider you know let's say the first byte or something to come back which presumably contains the header so the time that will take is theta so basically for both these conditions need to hold and that is where given the fact that you want both of them to hold the minimum time that is required will actually be the maximum of both of these components because you know both of them are necessary conditions so both will be done only by the time which is actually the larger of the two that is why we have max f theta over here so the second uh, th theorem in the case of the token ring protocol is that if we have a higher priority packet waiting the maximum inversion time is at max uh, is at the most two times this number which is 2 into max f theta and uh, the reasons are quite similar that it will undergo inversion until uh, the it gets the reservation which means the previous transmission completes right and uh, so which can take max f theta time and basically it will send a message and the message will come back so that is again one more max theta so that is why we max f theta i'm sorry so that is why the maximum inversion time is two times max f theta right so basically the two things have to finish one is that you know you might be unlucky that some other node a low priority node of course started to transmit and that's exactly when a high priority packet a high priority message arrived so this tra current transmission of course cannot be stopped because we don't have preemption so max f theta time is gone and then of course a new the token has to come back with a fresh reservation that is again max f theta so that is the reason for this doubling so given that we have seen the token ring protocol over here we will now uh, look at a window based protocol which again is more like our slotted approach so if you go back to the countdown protocol and the can bus and say, and so on the idea was the same that the timeline is divided into frame, frames so the current transmission window the current slot is defined by a tuple known as low and high which are nothing but the ranges of priority right so if a message has a priority which is between low and high and uh, so basically let's say that and a collision is detected every node will increment the value of low for that window right so basically any a message can only be transmitted if its priority is between low and high so whenever a collision is detected you just increment the value of low so as you detect more and more and more collisions the value of low keeps getting incremented so the window actually shrinks so as the window shrinks the number of possible messages that can actually be transmitted 
is reducing so that will reduce your chances of collision or increase your chances of a successful message transmission so if you have not noticed the pattern up till now let me tell you that there are fundamentally two kinds of protocols one are global priority based protocols fair of course you know you can uh, you will primarily look at slotted schemes in the variants of the countdown protocol or this window based protocol so the window based protocol is actually doing something more so let me discuss the other class and then i'll come back so then you can have bounded access protocols so in bounded access protocols the idea will be to limit the rate right to if you if you quench the rate in principle you will either make the chances of collision zero or reduce it substantially so calendar based and everything was coming in that in global priority there are two kinds one is slotted as was the case with the canvas for example or let's say things like the token ring where basically before every transmission you find the highest priority message or packet and you send that so of course in the case of a token ring it will be efficient if the message sizes are high uh, or let's say the message sizes are low but kind of doing this arbitration uh, this arbitration process is kind of fast right because if they are high it may, it may lead to long priority inversion times because the priority inversion time is basically two times max f theta so but again you know the key idea is that you either do it in a slotted fashion or you do it at the end of every message more or less can boil down to the same thing if you have you know constant length messages right because mind you that mo the moment a transmission has started a preemption is not possible but in a slotted fashion what happens is that uh, you do it at fixed instances of time which means that even if uh, you have finished transmitting a message but the next slot has not arrived you just wait you just idle but in a token ring that will not happen the moment one message has been sent we'll again start recirculating the token so the window based protocol in principle is like a hybrid of both in the sense as you can see there is a notion of bounded access in the sense only that message can be transmitted whose priority is between low and high and of course this window can grow and shrink and also the idea is that uh, we are uh, dealing with a slot based uh, system so in a sense it is combining both worlds right uh, so the, and here again you know when do you increase the size of the window so you increase the size of the window when you find that uh, you know a frame is free right so so there is nobody transmitting but yet there are packets waiting so you will dec decrement the value of flow so as we have said we have been playing around with different versions of either global priority the token ring being like the king of global priority or versions of bounded access with our latest protocol the window based scheme so let us now delve slightly more into bounded access and look at a few popular examples so for bounded access uh, the the same way that global priority was like the king uh, sorry the global priority protocols in in that space the king was e02.5 the token ring for bounded access the most popular ieee standard is e02.4 all right so and the r ether protocol so let us discuss e02.4 so this is used uh, in the this can be used along with the token ring and token burst networks it's a time token protocol so the idea is that you use the same basic token idea okay that a node can transmit when it holds the token but its time of transmission as such is bounded right which means that even if it does have the token its rights are not absolute so this is what helps us in providing real time guarantees so what we do is that we define the term the target token rotation time which is the expected time between a node having a token and then subsequently having a token or two consecutive visits of a token to a node so this is the important design parameter which we will look at right and uh, so in the context of this protocol 
periodic messages are called synchronous messages and ordinary messages which are i mean non periodic a periodic or sporadic are called asynchronous messages so what happens is that for the periodic messages or cbr kind of messages a portion of the synchronous bandwidth is allocated to the node so when a node receives the token it will of course transmit its real time messages which is expected which it is expected to do but after completing all of the synchronous traffic if it still has some time available so again you know this is a tricky and sticky thing it can send asynchronous messages right it can send some of its other messages that it has but this is again possible if it has the slack right in the sense that the token has arrived early or you know somehow some way if it has the slack it can be done but otherwise in the general case it cannot be done so here uh, you know some a little bit of math is used so let let us assume that the synchronous time requirement of node ni be hi where the units of hi are arbitrary but essentially for different nodes i j k and so on h i h j and h k are proportional to their bandwidth requirement right how much uh, network resources they should be given and let theta be the token propagation time over the entire bus so the target token uh, rotation time ttrd ttrt is essentially theta plus some other quantity so the first thing is why is it theta plus well the thing is that at least to get the token once you will have to circulate the token which means it needs to visit all the uh, nodes and come back to you so that is the theta and what is hi say so hi is basically the amount of time that is given to every synchronous node right to every uh, node that has some synchronous traffic so basically in a node one gets a chance then two then three then four then five and so on right the way that in which they are getting the token so you add up all their times and also add this number to theta so after all of them have done their job the token will finally come back to the original node and this is the target token rotation time ttrt which is used to characterize such systems it is possible you could have an asynchronous overrun time for which you know non real time messages are transmitted it could be the case so by design uh, the asynchronous overrun you know the total time between two successive visits of a token is limited to two times ttrt where the formula for ttrt was given in the previous slide so in a sense the token as such is designed to tolerate a little bit of jitter because you could have these you know asynchronous tasks that have arrived at a node so that is why this much of a window is provided for sending out those messages where the target token rotation time can at best or in the you know a more appropriate word would be in the worst case double due to asynchronous overrun so for a node that is using only the synchronous mode the time between consecutive token arrivals will still be limited by ttrt but again as i said if you have asynchronous messages this could be the case so let us assume again in the context of this protocol that node ni has a message with the shortest deadline and let this deadline be capital delta so because we know that uh, 2 into ttrt is the maximum Uh, right uh, time between two token visits if we have an asynchronous overrun the value of ttrt should be set to less than delta by 2 such that at least we can get the token back and then when we get the token back we'll then transmit right so what will happen if ttrt is greater than delta by 2 well we will get the token late and as a result we'll miss deadlines so now the question is what is how do i compute hi right so we have not discussed much about computing hi other than saying that it will be it is a number that is proportional to the bandwidth requirement of a node but we have not gone further than that 
So if we look at this uh, expression over here, TTRT minus theta is equal to summation of HI. So let's just look at this very quickly. So what we do is that TTRT minus theta is definitely summation of HI. See each HI is basically this value multiplied with this quantity over here. What is this quantity? So CI by TI, well, we will see what it is. So CI by TI, we need to look at this example. So CI is essentially the amount of data you need to send per unit time. So basically CI is nothing but the amount of data that needs to be sent. Right, so I just looked up an example amount of data. And this thing over here is the time. So CI by TI is pretty much the bandwidth. Right, it is the bandwidth requirement of every node in the sense that within this period of time, how much of data it needs to send. So if you think about it, uh, it is basically being divided by the summation of the bandwidth. So this is like a weight, right? So the weight is what is your relative bandwidth requirement as a fraction of the global sum. So we, you, you can say that HI is basically TTRT minus theta multiplied with its relative bandwidth. What is the relative bandwidth? It's its actual bandwidth requirement divided by the sum of the actual bandwidth requirements of the entire system, right? It plus everybody else. So this is a fraction. This fraction is multiplied with TTRT minus theta to get HI. And you can easily see that if I sum up all of these fractions across all I, it will actually be equal to one. And so then, you know, this will make sense in the other equation that defines TTRT in the first place, right? So this establishes the internal consistency. The short example, something that I was alluding to, is that let's say there are multiple nodes. Each node needs to transmit some amount of data in some time, some amount of data in some time. So to find a TTRT, what do we do? If we, let's say, set the propagation time to zero. So what we do is that the TTRT ideally, let's, should be 200 by two because we're assuming that for N3, Every 200 milliseconds, it needs to send some data. So we are making the assumption that every 200 milliseconds, it needs to get the token back. If we are assuming non-synchronous traffic, like a periodic traffic and so on, then as we have seen, the maximum could be two times TTRT. So it is always a better idea to set uh, the round trip time to 100 milliseconds. And then, of course, what we can do is we can compute C1 by T1, C2 by T2 using, uh, you know, the data of the previous slide, which is how much of traffic it needs to send per unit, uh, per time, right? Traffic time. And then compute the relative values and multiply it with 100. So then what you will see is you will get H1, H2, and H3, which are the relative transmission times. And you can add these three numbers up, you will see that the sum will be equal to 100. So now let us look at our ether. So, but before that, a short look is due on our two protocols, A02.4 and A02.5. So, A02.4 was, you know, like a token ring plus some degree of bounded access, where the amount of bounded, uh, where the access the time that was given was a function of basically the requirement, right? Uh, basically the relative bandwidth requirement in the sense you need more, take more time. So this same philosophy was pursued by the makers of RMA as well, which means that if let's say you have messages with a lower period, you take more time. 802.5 on the other hand was a pure global priority protocol where every time you arbitrate for the highest priority message and then that message is transmitted. Now let us look at our ether which is real-time ethernet. 
So it actually doesn't do much. It's a hybrid protocol that switches between Ethernet and a token ring protocol to provide guarantees to real-time applications because as we have seen, Ethernet's guarantees are really bad. So transmissions will occur in two modes. One is the regular Ethernet mode where you sense the channel and transmit only when you find it to be free, which is CSMA, Carrier Sense Multiple Access, or the Rether mode. So it will, of course, switch seamlessly to the Rether mode when it sees that it has real-time messages. And when the real-time sessions terminate, it will trans transition back to the regular CSMA or Ethernet mode. So in the case of a real-time request, if the network is not in our ether mode, it will first broadcast a message that, look, we need to get back to the real-time mode and only then start real-time transmissions, right? So basically, see, what you are seeing up till now is that you are seeing that there, there are two opposing camps, right, with both camps appearing to be equally strong. One is the bounded access camp which is uh, captured by A02.4 and the other is the global priority camp which is captured by the CAN bus and A02.5, the pure token ring. And then of course you have these hybrid protocols. We have seen a couple of them, uh, right, uh, such as the window based protocol and our ether now, which basically switch to this mode when they have a real time packet. And uh, so the key idea is if you're transmitting something, you wait for it to end. And then you send an acknowledgement, all of you move to the R Ether mode. And the R Ether mode, you go back, you basically implement a traditional token ring or a token bus, where of course the highest priority message gets transmitted. And you of course create a token and also circulate. So of course, more than one node can initiate the switch, switch message to basically the R Ether mode. So the key idea is that an initiator A, initiator means an initiator to switch to this mode, will send an acknowledgement to another initiator B, only if B's node ID is smaller than A's, right? In a sense, A has a larger node ID, where the node ID is, of course, uh, set uh, beforehand, and the node ID is unknown. And if, of course, uh, let's say there is a network loss, in a sense, an ACK or something gets lost, then the initiator will retry for a fixed number of times. So what our ether finally does, so what it finally does is that it uses a timed token scheme, right? Which basically means that at any time only one node can transmit and it is also allowed only one real-time request. In the sense, it cannot hog the network by just putting in real-time request after real-time request, right? So that is not allowed. And based on the amount of data it needs to send, you could add other policies as well. It will say that, look, this is the transmission bandwidth that I need to require, that, that I need. So this is something that is specified a priori at the beginning. And using the same concept of the TTRT, what we will do is that we will divide the nodes themselves into two sets, the real-time set and the non real time set so then of course different nodes can reserve bandwidths for each session so the key point is that in the r ether mode of course the token will visit each node as we have seen the token will just you know go from node 1 to node 2 to node 3 it will keep going in this fashion and the node having the token will transmit its real time data and then once it is done, it will send the token to the next node, whosoever deserves it. So then, you know, after a real-time session has ended, and if there are no more reservations in the sense there are no more real-time messages to be sent, the last node in the real-time set would pass the token to the non-real-time set. Right? So let MTHT, which is the max maximum token holding time, uh, right, sorry, the mean token holding time B for node NI, right, MTHTI. So the token will then be tagged with a time to deadline field, which is like this that you look at the TTRT, you add the token holding times of everybody in the real time set, 
and if there is still some slack available then this slack could be used for other purposes so we will see what so this is again you know a standard feature of all our protocols that you see what is the ttrt in the sense how frequently you need the token so let us say you need the token once every 200 milliseconds but the actual work that all the nodes are doing is maybe 100 milliseconds so this basically means that as far as you are concerned 100 milliseconds of slack exists in every 200 millisecond window so then uh, the thing is that you can schedule non-real time traffic in this window again we have been seeing the same pattern in edf and rma and so on that whenever you find these free slots you schedule other non-real time messages at that time as long as real time traffic will not be affected right real time traffic in this case real time tasks in the case of cpu scheduling if yes uh, then uh, you know if we can send then what we do is that a non real time message is sent right and then of course the token is passed if there is no time to send any more non real time data then again the token is passed to a real time node to transmit real time data right so so that is the uh, that is the simple idea so every time in such kind of a regime that we are adding a new task so as we have seen for non real time tasks it basically happens on an on demand basis that if you have time you have some way of arbitrating between them uh, right uh, so again in a non real time task will not have priority but you could just go by round robin or fairness or FIFO, so that is not important. But the issue is that whenever a new real time request comes, there is a need for checking the schedulability as we were doing with tasks that is known as admission control. So there is a need to actually do it and see if uh, we can accommodate it or not. So this is, of course, done. And then uh, nothing much. So this uh, idea is. Quite similar that for the non real time set, we can al always reserve some bandwidth and uh, then we can treat that itself as a real time transmission. Where what you are doing is that you are looking at the token holding time of all the real time tasks. And let's say you are adding a new real time task, so you are including that as well. And let's say you are including, you are treating all the non real time transmissions as again one more task and you're adding all of them up the same way we were adding up cpu utilizations in the case of cpu scheduling so in this case what you do is you add all of them up which is basically your committed resources to real-time tasks and new real-time task that is coming the resources that you would require of course in terms of bandwidth and again uh, the uh, network resources that you are committing again in terms of bandwidth to non real time tasks so the moment you do all of that right this should be less than ttrt right uh, so so where of course you know we are using time as a proxy for bandwidth so we are basically saying that um, if you are getting 20 milliseconds in let's say 1000 millisecond window the effective bandwidth that we are getting is 20 times 1000 into the multiplied with the peak bandwidth of the channel Right. So once a real time requirement of a node is done, it is removed from the RTS. So if you look at all the message sets, each network now needs to cater to many kinds of messages. You have a real time message set. You also have a non real time message set. The real time messages themselves can be classified into three types. So ideally, it should be schedulable and unschedulable. But again, the schedulable messages have been classified into two types, unsaturated and saturated. So an unsaturated schedule is when the message set is not schedulable. In the sense, I need to send a bunch of messages with deadlines, and I cannot come up with a feasible schedule. Uh, right? No, sorry, uh, non schedulable is I stand corrected. What I was trying to say is non schedulable basically means that I have a set of messages with deadlines, and regardless of whatever I want to do, I am not able to schedule. Now, let us come to unsaturated schedulable, right? 
here this says that the message sets are schedulable. Even if there is a little bit of disturbance in the sense the size of a message is slightly increased, for instance, the set still remains schedulable in the sense it is robust, right? Or there is sufficient slack available that even if there is a slight increase in the message size, it doesn't really matter. So, of course, in this case, the channel utilization will be low. This has created sl slack in the first place. On the other hand, a saturated schedulable set is where you have message sets which are otherwise schedulable, but they cannot tolerate small increases in the size because the moment you do that, the message set will become unschedulable. Right? So, unschedulable means that your message sets for which <coughs> the deadline will be missed, right? So this was classic unschedulable. But the thing is, saturated schedulable are things at the boundary where you increase the size of messages a little bit and that would basically transition from schedulable to unschedulable. So you can think of like a class of tasks which are saturated unschedulable, a set of classes which are unschedulable, and then the set of classes at the boundary Right again at the upper half of the boundary, not the lower half, of course, which can transition downwards if there is a slight increase in the size of a message. So, the utilization metrics would be like this that we can compare the performance of different protocols using two terms one is the absolute breakdown utilization, and other is the guaranteed probability at a certain utilization u. So, let's first look at the absolute. Uh, bound, right? So if you just go back, the absolute breakdown utilization. So the ABU of a network indicates what is the level of utilization for a given set of messages, of course, at which the messages start to miss their respective deadlines. So it is kind of things that take you to the peak, like your peak rate of utilization. So it's like the boundary between, uh, you know, unschedulable and saturated schedulable, right? And this is, of course, the average utilization of the entire message set. So ABU is pretty much the maximum amount of traffic that a network can support, right? Without anybody, any message missing its deadline. The guaranteed probability is the probability that all the deadlines of a message set at a given utilization will be met. If utilization is lower than the ABU, the value of GPU will be close to 1. If it's more than the ABU, it will approach 0, right? So the interesting thing is that what does the, how does the ABU look with the bandwidth of the channel? So we will compare our two friends, our opposing enemies, which are 802.4 and 802.5. So the moment you have some degree of bounded access, what really happens? So for low bandwidth networks, right, the moment you have global priority, that works really well. Because the point is you quickly find out what you are supposed to do and your global priority will scale really well. Because after all, global priority ensures that things are much better schedulable, right? As we have seen in the case of EDF, for example, so for, let's say for bandwidths that are low, our global protocol, which is 802.5, actually does really grow. However, our bounded access version, 802.4, actually starts doing much better when we have higher bandwidth, because at this point, the negative roles of bounded access don't really play that much of a role. And again, for high bandwidth, right, where, of course, you can send network messages very quickly, for every message trying to arbitrate, this priority-based arbitration actually puts a big overhead on the network and hence it is not a good idea in terms of performance. So that is why the moral of the story is that choose a global priority like 802.5 protocol if you have a low bandwidth system or you choose more of a bounded access token ring kind of thing if you have a high bandwidth system. Relationship between performance and bandwidth. So as you can see, with A02.4, it improves monotonically with bandwidth. In A02.5, it initially improves and then it dips. Why the anomaly here? 
beyond a certain bandwidth? Well, the frame, so as you can see in A02.5, when we are doing the analysis back then, which is like 30, 40 slides ago, we found that basically the key term is max f theta, right? So that is the frame transmission time and two times this, uh, you know, was related to uh, the time that is required for priority inversion. So when the frame, uh, so beyond a certain bandwidth, what will happen at a high bandwidth, the frame transmission time as such will become low, right? So, the, so this quantity will become low, but the token transmission time to kind of go through all the nodes would still remain relatively higher. As a result, this theta factor will dominate. In, in the sense, in max f theta, it will actually be equal to theta. Whereas, if the bound, bandwidth is low, max f theta will be equal to f. So, the key point is that in this expression, you'll have to see what it evaluates to. At the time of its good performance, which is low bandwidth, it will evaluate to this, otherwise it will evaluate to that. So, which means that, you know, in a very high bandwidth setting, something that we were discussing, this process of global arbitration, which means the token has to go and reach all the nodes, they'll have to see the reservation and overwrite it if required. This actually will take a lot of time, much more than the time it takes to transmit a frame which means we'll waste a lot of time. As a result, its performance will tank. So again, what is the GPU for uh, versus utilization for low and high bandwidth? So again, we are plotting the same thing. So what you see is that again, for a low utilization, uh, the GPU is tending to one, right? And again, for a high utilization, Right, again, for a low bandwidth scenario, A02.4, of course, does poorly, but then again, you know, this 1 to 0 transition for A02.5 happens later. The trend is exactly the reverse in the high bandwidth kind of setting, where A02.5 tanks earlier than A02.4. So, the summary bounded access protocols impact messages with, uh, you know, definitely short deadlines so at low bandwidth. you know, it is much better to go for global priority because, uh, you know, with short deadlines, the moment you have, you know, smaller deadlines, bounded access protocols will impact messages because you, you can't transmit at that high rate, right? So the point is that you are given a limited amount of time, but within that, you'll not be able to transmit all your messages. So that will impact you. At higher bandwidths, bounded access is not all that bad. But priority driven protocols, it will take so long to actually arbitrate that it will take a lot of time for you to figure out what to transmit next, which is not really in our interests. So that's the reason you use a different kind of protocol, right? You don't use global priority based protocols when you have high bandwidth. So this completes this lecture. So we will again be discussing different variants of uh, real-time communication, of course, at a different scale, more at the web scale in the next lecture.